So uh, welcome everyone again to um, the 10th SOAS World Philosophies Lecture Series. Um, my name is Dr. Elvis Imafidon, um, and we've um, had uh, some very interesting discussions and lectures in the last nine uh, lectures that we've had. Um, it's interesting that we have Professor Richard King here because I think he, he began this, this series um, January, uh, February 2021. And Richard King is now with us here at SOAS. We, we stole him and brought him here. So it's nice to have him here with us. Um, um, the idea is basically to continue to explore thematic and theoretical issues in philosophy from a global perspective. Um, Allowing, from a, allowing for a more inclusive and decolonial approach to doing philosophy. And we've had very interesting themes uh, in the last um, nearly two years from African perspective, um, Mexican perspective, and so on. And we've had some very interesting lectures on what philosophy is itself. Um, or, um, and um, so we're really looking forward to today's one as well. So um, my colleague, uh, Dr. Andrew Hines, is here and he will be uh, the anchor man for this um, lecture. He will introduce our speaker and also um, uh, lead us through the, uh, uh, the comment and question session. So um, Dr. Andrew Hines. Uh, thanks so much, Elvis. Um, hello, everyone. And thank you so much for coming today. Uh, just again, please mute yourselves when you're in the room. Um, so that we can all hear the, the speaker. Um, it's my enormous pleasure today to, to be here with you all and to welcome um, Dr. Elise Kokoro Salma um, to speak to us today. Um, just a bit of information if you don't already know her work, she's the recipient of the Erwin Schrodinger Fellowship. Um, she spends her time kind of, if I correct me if I'm wrong, Elise, but between uh, Delhi and, and Massachusetts. Um, she works on intercultural philosophy and in particular on contemporary Indian philosophy and is the co-editor of the special issue of Sophia on the challenge of post-colonial philosophy in India. Um, and there's a few other things you can read about in her biography, but I'm really pleased to welcome her today because um, I first encountered her work on a, on a now famous article about why should we take up the challenge of contemporary Indian philosophy. And I was really drawn to um, the way in which she brings together intellectual history on the one hand and philosophical close reading and argumentation on the other. So I am um, excited and honored that she's joining us today and she'll speak with us um, on humanism and contemporary Indian philosophy. Before I turn it over to her, just a few ground rules. Um, at least you can speak um, for the link we've agreed. And then at the end of that time, we'll open it up to questions. So please everyone just hold on to your questions until the end and we'll have a, a lovely discussion afterwards. So um, without further ado, Elise, over to you. Thank you so much for the nice and generous introduction. Um, I'll start slowly first by sharing my screen. Okay, is it fine? And can you hear me all right, Andrew? Yeah, yeah. yeah. okay. Yeah. Okay, you'll have to be a little patient with me because I have a small screen today. So I'll have to adjust a little bit between you, my slides and my notes. Mm -hmm. But um, I'll start. So thank you so much for coming this morning or afternoon or evening. And I'll to start without further ado, so um, I'm working on humanism in contemporary Indian philosophy. And what I will do today is this a reflection on what is humanism in contemporary Indian philosophy. So I want to start with a kind of introduction with a few points that are important to keep in mind during the talk, kind of methodological and conceptual framework. The first is, of course, there are many Indian philosophies in the plural, in different languages, in different even regions in the world these days, in different institutional structures that are more or less traditional, more or less working closely with 
Sanskrit sources in particular, more or less globalized. So this is one way and there are other ways to do it and other authors, but I work with Indian philosophy in English in philosophy department of public Indian universities in the 20th century. Mostly the second half, but actually it um, it starts also earlier. And so humanism in this talk, I am not really trying to make a kind of descriptive view of humanism as if it was something that is already scholarly established, like as if it were a movement or a school of Indian philosophy. Um, but I'm trying to reflect about what it actually brings to our understanding of Indian philosophy to think with the category of humanism. So in that sense, I don't mean and I don't imply that it's a standard category, but more like a working hypothesis. And it does not need to be a standard category. We can also discuss whether it is appropriate and whether it is useful to think of contemporary Indian philosophy in these terms. Um, and so following this point, um, this lecture and in general, the lectures that I hold in, let's say, global philosophy departments, so outside India in particular, is, um, is always a place to reflect about what we do with Indian philosophy uh, in a global world. And in this lecture in particular, I mean, the idea of humanism, it's also a reflection I'm trying to have on compartments and borders in world philosophy and how to think and how to include more of Indian philosophy in this global department. And in particular, why it could be useful to renew our categories and our ways to understand Indian philosophy, in that case, not as something that stops at the pre-modern time, at the classical time, and something that is still living and as something that continued to evolve even after neo advaita philosophy. And so I'm trying a little bit to challenge the relations between classical and contemporary, like to challenge the dichotomies and the oppositions that we often see between classical and contemporary or modern, and between neo advaita philosophy that is supposed to be the latest kind of philosophy and the possibility of a continuity in Indian philosophy. So today, so these are kind of points that I want to make clear and that remain valid for the presentation. Now today, what I will do is um, simply I will argue that there is a shift, a conceptual shift, that is operating in the approximately mid 20th century in academic Indian philosophy in English. As I said, mostly after independence, but actually the more I look at it and the more I see like kind of seeds that were planted before this, so as a kind of um, gradual continuation and evolution. I will try obviously to characterize this shift um, and in particular, I want to show some text and some philosophers and their idea of humanism. And I can already add now what it does not mean in this lecture. So in this lecture, humanism is not opposing human against nature. It will be clear, I think, in the lecture itself, but humanism in this context is much more in opposition to transcendental idealism or to an idea of a cosmology as in a solipsistic liberation, then it is in opposition to nature. And the opposition to nature uh, with the question of technology or things that are related to that in, in Heidegger and in Western um, phenomenology are um, more reinterpreted in the Indian context as a distinction from Indian philosophy that is not in opposition to nature in these terms, in technological terms. So in at no 
moment, um, human means here um, op radical opposition to nature. And uh, two more small notes as an introduction. I chose not to focus on one philosopher because I'm trying to show you how I work and the kind of general shift that I see. Obviously, it means that they have to isolate philosophers and ideas. And so there are, of course, counter exceptions. I do not mean that all Indian philosophers of contemporary times are interested in humanism. But I see it as a general shift that tells us something about Indian philosophy and the relation that Indian philosophy has with different traditions in its own, the Western tradition. And finally, the last point that I want to announce, and on which I also think, is I'm not really interested, neither here nor actually in my work, in characterizing humanism as something that is Indian or not Indian, and I'm not really interested in defining it in a position or in distinction or even in similarity with European humanism, Western humanism. Um, there are explicit and clear influences from the philosophical anthropological movement uh, or from the phenomenological movement and even inspiration from the humanism of the European Renaissance. And it is clearly and explicitly a dialogue that includes non-Indian sources. And from the perspective of an Indian philosopher in the mid 20th century, not including Western, like not being aware of Western development would just be considered ignorance. So in a way, it is not an option as we had in Europe. But the whole point, uh, I think today is not anymore to compare in in these terms, to not um, try to essentialize humanism as something that comes from the Western European movement and to which India responded, and whether it's more or less uh, the same or it's more or less authentic, um, simply for the reason that this presupposes always that we take as a paradigm the Western conception of humanism, and it's not something that I'm really interested in doing. So, what is important actually for me is to see how this category is relevant to think about compartment and to question the rupture, the radical rupture that we see between classical and modern and Indian and Western philosophy. So one thing that we should emphasize in this context is the complexity of this identity. The dichotomies between India and the West in classical and contemporary for the others in the 20th century simply does not operate because they are using Western concepts to combat Indian orthodoxy at times. They are criticizing the predecessors of modern Indian philosophy to distinguish them philosophy. They use classical Indian concepts that resonate without feeling bound to be respected to a historically defined use of it. And they criticize Western Indian interpretation, Western interpretation of Indian philosophy. And so the hermeneutic structure, the dialogical structure is and remain complex. And that's the interesting part of it. And I will continue. Mm -hmm. I will continue with this. So, one second. Okay. So, I like to begin 
especially in in global philosophy department i like to begin with the problem of absence the problem of absence of contemporary indian philosophy in our global departments for the fact that it's interesting that although more and more indian philosophy is included in our departments including um kind of renewal of interest in modern indian philosophy uh, figures like tagore or robindo yet anglophon contemporary philosophers of the indian academia remains quite absent okay. so for this i made on uh, this first Mm, this first slide, a list of anthologies of contemporary Indian philosophy. And I do not mean to say that these are the only ones that have been published, like the only publications in contemporary Indian philosophy. They are definitely not. And of course, there are a lot of articles also and a lot of other books, but they are the most explicit ones focusing on contemporary Indian philosophy. And if you look at the authors there, I just need to zoom, I'm sorry. Um, so you have Ramohan Rai, Tagore, this one Tagore, actually. Um, Ramakrishna Vivekananda, Dayananda, Gandhi, Sri Aurobindo, and then again, Ramakrishna Vivekananda, Tagore, Gandhi, Aurobindo, Radhakrishna, Kumaraswami, Iqbal. Iqbal is the only Muslim philosophers. Um, and in all of them, if we look a little, a little quickly, but if we look at uh, all of them, the list is more or less standard. And more importantly, academic Indian philosophers are very few, and that is Kismakachari. And Radhakrishnan, who was most public figure and also an academic Indian philosopher. Most of the other authors, and um, I'm sure you all know that like most of them or all of them are actually public figures, public intellectuals, political figures engaged in Indian independence, that's of course for Gandhi, uh, spiritual figures, that's the case of Aurobindo, but also Vivekananda, Ramakrishna, Swami Dayananda, and so on. And Iqbal, as I said, was the only Muslim Indian philosophers. But so the list, the list almost entirely excludes academic Indian philosophy. And Kesa Chidananda Murti, who I follow for this analysis, comments that these books are actually the manuals that they use for teaching in India. And the criteria for including or excluding philosophers are not very clear. And there are, of course, he notices also little academic philosophers. This is important for the way that we teach, think, and write about contemporary Indian philosophy. It tells us that the selection and the exclusion of academic Indian philosophers operate in has long-lasting influences. And the question is why? I used to think that it's because we have less resources, we have less manuals, we don't have a lot of um, documents that are available. After researching in particular in India and more and more, I think that's not the problem. There are huge um, piles of actually extremely good journals that have been published throughout the 20th century. Um, a list of Tashrif compilations with um, extremely well documented articles and a lot of monographs. So I think Raghu Ramaraju is right in that what is missing is the ready made aspect that is a kind of inclusion of academic Indian philosophy in a larger framework that would be these anthologies with historical context, philosophical context, and ways to use this um, text. 
importantly, or more philosophically, the question is how to put academic Indian philosophy together, how to think of Indian academic philosophy as a whole. And that's a bigger problem for, I'm sorry again for the slides, I'll have to switch back and forth. So, Sajidana Murti, who writes an excellent, actually, um, book that is called Philosophy in India, which is, by the way, the only book I found which explicitly mentions Muslim Indian philosophy, Christian Indian philosophy, Parsi Indian philosophy, Sikh Indian philosophy, that is different communities within the academic Indian philosophy. And so he writes on, he comments on four anthologies on contemporary Indian philosophy on academic Indian philosophy that have been published in the 20th century. And I, for your references, I put the bibliographical reference on the right, the, the ones that he's speaking about. And I will just read it to give you an idea of the diversity of academic Indian philosophy and why it is also a problem to find a fitting description to talk about contemporary Indian philosophy. So he writes four collections of papers by different professional philosophers, edited by Radhakrishnan and Muirad, Asachidandana Murti, and Ramakrishna Rao, Margaret Chatterjee, and Anka Devaraj, give a quite comprehensive presentation of the trends of philosophical thinking within Indian universities from the mid-30s to the mid-70s. For the first volume, there was not a single atheist or a materialist among its 25 contributors. All of them, except seven, were predominantly influenced by Advaita Vedanta, and 19 of them were idealists of some sort or other. This is um, the case in the anthology by Radhakrishna. In the second volume, the fair is varied. Among its 22 contributors, they are an economist trying to understand the philosophical task, four humanists, a Marxist, an empirical atheistic dualist, an empirical theist, a pragmatist, an Aurobindo follower, two personalists, a phenomenologist, a language analyst, three advising, so Vishat advising, an absolutist, an advocate of a worldview based on aesthetic experience, an analyst, metaphysician, and an axiomatic ex exponent. And that's a list that um, that sounds a lot, and that's precisely why I put it on the slide. It's not to make you tired already, but it's to show you the diversity of academic Indian philosophy in English, and to raise the question after that of how difficult it is to describe and then to include. Indian, um, contemporary Indian philosophy in an anthology, in a syllabus, in teachings, because of its diversity and question how should we describe it, how should we understand it. And then it continues. In the third volume among its 14 contributors, there are an analyst metaphysician, three analysts, a Thomist, a humanist, a Shaiva theist, an advaitin, a phenomenologist, a logician, an existentialist, a logician idealist, a personalist theist, and an interpreter of aesthetic experience. And in the four volumes, um, he continues a little bit the same, except you have two exponents of anthropological standpoints applied to philosophy, Humanist, phenomenologist, existentialist, advaita, still there, an advocate for the autonomy of philosophy, and a paper. And then one more remark that is also important in the last two volumes, no materialist or Marxist finds its place. Marxism in philosophy had a period that was lively in contemporary Indian philosophy, but it seems not to have sustained, at least according to Sachidandana Murti. And so he also concludes that this gives kind of an idea, a snapshot, if you want, or kind of a very quick and condensed idea of the kinds of philosophies 
that were developed in Indian universities in the 20th century. So again, the question is how, if we work with contemporary Indian philosophy, and if we want to speak about contemporary Indian philosophy, how not to betray this diversity, how not to constrain it to some schools to say contemporary Indian philosophy is new advisor, or contemporary Indian philosophy is only analytical Indian philosophy because of the British influence. So how to retain its diversity and not to reduce it to Western categories or Western schools or Western understanding of the Indian schools and say, this is Nyaya, this is Advaita. Can we define Indian philosophy in a way that it does not freeze it into one idea? And so, of course, and um, you probably can anticipate my response and my tentative answer is to try to look at it from a humanistic perspective, or to try to characterize, characterize it as a shift, an important shift towards humanity. And so this shift that is presented by Sachidananda Murti, who was working in South India, is, I think, described in philosophical terms, that is, in conceptual terms, by Daya Krishna, who was in Rajasthan University in the 20th century. And so I think the shift that Murti's, Murti in that paper is really kind of analyzing the production of philosophy in India and looking for what has been published and how we can describe it. Daya Krishna looks at it from a different perspective, that is from the perspective of conceptual evolution, in a book that is called uh, Developments in Indian Philosophy from 18th Century Onwards, Classical and Western. And so I will read this quote. Again, I apologize for the short silences when I go back and forth my PowerPoint. So there Krishna writes to describe the spirit, the self with which the philosophical thought of India had been concerned both in traditional and modern times, gradually takes a fuller content and becomes more disworldly as philosophical thinking moves into the later half of the 20th century. And the Banerjee had already cut off its moorings from the quest for immortality and relationships to other beings with whom one was or could be in possible communication. Even earlier, a moral dimension seems to have been added to it right from Vivekananda onwards, bypassing the deep conflict between dharma and moksha, which had characterized Indian thinking in this regard from the beginning. A new kind of anthropocentrism in humanism appears to have taken hold of Indian thinkers, and we have the interesting spectacle of a development of man-centered thought in different directions. Thus, we have the radical humanism of M. Roy, the value-centered thought of M. Kadevaraj, and the anthropocentric and history-centered thought of Professor Dipi Chattopadhyay. So, I have to say, of course, that this is Daya Krishna's take, and Daya Krishna himself was mm, very interested in let's say not producing the standard in a little bit cliche idea that Indian philosophy is about liberation and attaining moksha. So of course his interpretation um, is influenced by his own thinking. Nevertheless, I think the shift that he sees is, first it, I agree, that is actually visible, but also it's very interesting in what it says about Indian philosophy. It says first that indeed, unlike what we usually read, the story does not end with new Advaita, as we often believe Indian philosophy stops there, and it stops in a transcendental idealism, and it stops with liberation, and it 
stops with your with your focus on a self that is an absolute self. And it tells us, I think, also that there is no radical epistemological rupture happening with colonization in the sense that this shift, I think, is not is not a radical shift that totally breaks away with Indian tradition and would only be a westernized Indian philosophy. There is a lot of interest and a lot of responses, not only to Neo Advaita and to people like Aurobindo and Vilkananda, but also a lot of reusing classical concepts with different meanings and with different interpretations. Um, but there is no radical rupture. And uh, there is also no, I think, specific point from which it would radically become different. I see it again more as a gradual evolution already in Orbindo, there is an engagement with sciences and evolution and just continues like it actually does also um, in the West as a kind of play of criticism and responses and in evolution. And of course, um, they are also very different, and I, I'll mention this in a little bit. There are also different understanding of what is humanism that are more or less spiritual and more or less um, secular or politically critical. So, so what is um, humanism in that sense at this moment, how can we characterize it? I think, and it's um, also a comment by Ramakam Sinari, that one of the major characteristics is the term from solipsism, which doesn't necessarily mean a secularism or a secular view of Indian philosophy as uh, totally rejecting the idea of, of moksha and liberation, but in any case, it is a term from a solipsistic account of liberation. Liberation also, of course, influenced by the fact that India was struggling against colonization and so freedom and liberation became entangled in the mid-century. So liberation is also connected to the idea of freedom and it is then a struggle in the world. It is not a struggle to reach a liberation out of the world, to be detached from the world, but the liberation here and now engaged in political questions, social questions, historical questions. And so just before I turn to the next, I want to add just a few notes on the people that they Krishna evokes there and their humanism in, in um, two, three lines. So Andrew Banerjee, he writes there, had a cut of its moving from the quest for immortality and relationship to other beings with whom one was or could be in possible communication. Andrew Banerjee explores how the development of personhood from a stage of individual bondage to liberation as a kind of collective identity. And that's how it is interesting to see how they reuse in very contemporary ways classical Indian philosophy. And with Banerjee keeps the idea of reaching liberation and that we are bounded when we are in the world. But the avidya, the ignorance, the nature of the primary ignorance that holds us to the sphere of the world and ignorance is the illusion of being alone in the world. And so he develops a philosophy where gradually we have to detach ourselves from ourselves to realize the idea that I with others, that I am primarily and essentially connected with others in a unity that is a we. And so we is the ultimate realization of philosophy that we always have been together. <clears throat> 
Come in the guy. I won't speak too much here about him because I see him more as one of the influence on contemporary Indian philosophers in academia. Um, I mean, the guy was a revolutionary interested in social progress and in, in the struggle for independence. And so he was, he developed an idea of radical humanism which is a quest for freedom that was really associated with the freedom movement and is more politically grounded. So I think it's one influence, and say a word about it, one influence on contemporary academic Indian philosophy. And Kedavaraj Alam is the one who developed the idea of humanism historically and philosophically the most explicitly in all of his monograph in Indian philosophy, in Western philosophy, and we'll, we'll see in a second what he thinks is humanism. And Deepika Tupadhyaya, that Daya Krishna is mentioning as in the end, is concerned with, is challenging the universal and impersonal claims of scientific knowledge by arguing that science is essentially a historical phenomenon and thus it's also subject to changes, to historical changes. So his challenge of what he sees as a Western scientism is grounded in anthropology, in the anthropological view of sciences. And he's also extremely famous for being um, the editor of a a huge project of history of Indian science, philosophy, and cultures. It has so many volume and have in that project of wanting to develop a historically grounded and scientifically grounded knowledge of Indian heritage and history, culture, philosophy. So that's for the people mentioned by their question. Now, very shortly, because Devaraj is the one who puts the most words on it. Um, his definition, again, I apologize. Um, I won't read everything, but just the beginning of both, first on the right. Creative humanism adopts both theoretical instance with the significant difference that it installs the evolving cultural self in place of Atman or Tao and exhorts us to live in and work for its enrichment and growth. It also declare, declares itself as against the eternal Atman or absolute of the Vedanta to be the object of philosophic analysis and knowledge. So this is a clear um, view, and it represents not only Enke Devaraj, but um, all, I think, generation of contemporary Indian philosophers. And it expresses very well how they keep a look at classical Indian philosophy, but they refuse to see it is in a beginningless, endless, um, perspective to see it as a uh, absolute conception of the self that is connected to a cosmos. So it's really um, a criticism of this idea of self as something that was there once and for all and that we should reach outside of the common world. And so on the left, I describe it in a different way, creative humanism is a type of man-centered philosophy which takes creativity to be the dominant and most important characteristic of the human beings. So here the term man-centered has twofold significance. It implies that the proper object of philosophical inquiry is man himself. And then he continues in the second place, the epithet man-centered is intended to exclude superhuman reference from our view of the universe. So he chooses superhuman and then he explains why supernatural. And this again refers to um, the exclusion of Brahman or the 
the will to have a self that is grounded in the world. Come back. Okay. Um, these are not the only authors, even Daya Krishna includes Sundara Rajan, Basan Kumar Malik, Sachidandana Murti himself, Sivajiban Bhattacharya, Rajinda Prasad, um, a list of philosophers that in their own rights deserve to be there, but I can't go on everything. So what we should um, remember from this part is I think the main opposition or the main difference or the main shift from humanism at this point is an opposition to solipsism and an opposition to the idea that renouncing the world should be an ideal and that reaching an absolute out of the world should be uh, the aim of philosophy. There are two more characteristics that the Krishna sees. If you can't see, I have a sign of my screen. If you cannot read the PowerPoint, let me know. So there's the second aspect of humanism in that sense is a return from the temporal to the temporal historical living world of the embodied being and it's connected to the first aspect of course and Daya Krishna writes the return to the temporal historical living world of the embodied being who is a member of society and polity and actively participates in the building up of a permanent subjective world in cooperation with other human beings seems to be a common concern of most Indian philosophers who have written in the English language after their contact with the Western world. But yet, while the emphasis in Kisipatacharya's thought was primarily on a return from the identification of the self with each succeeding level of objectivity, seeing thereby the essential freedom of man as consisting in this the identification so case but the chaya is still um located in the transcendental absolute goal of philosophy it is only later thinkers starting from envy banerjee that the isolated de-identified self is understood not in terms of freedom but as deprived and cut off from its relationship with the others which constitute according to him the essential reality of the step and in the fulfillment of this relational obligation lies its real freedom. And then Kalidas Bhattacharya, who is the son of Kesi Bhattacharya, uh, lies in between in detail difference already with his father, but he's um, still indeed conceiving the self in isolation from other self or not necessarily at least related to other self in the sense of Banerjee. In Mohendi and Sundara Rajan, we find the impulse to return more self-consciously and concretely formulated, a return which becomes even more emphatically visible in the concern with historicity so explicitly manifest in the writings of the picture. So this is, um, I mean, the expected counter movement to solipsism. So if you refuse solipsism and the idea of the individual transcendental liberation out of the world, then of course you are looking at questions in intersubjectivity, at the relevance of historicity to an extent, um, question in hermeneutics. Um, and so there is here, of course, an influence of concepts like being in the world, concepts like the life world that are strongly phenomenologically influenced, but also in here again, uh, the diversity of the responses is interesting. It is also a challenge to 
what is felt as too much emphasis on sciences as something um, that is on the course of sciences, on the universal course of sciences. And Dupitya Patopadia comments on the, for example, the discussion between Tagore and Einstein, where Tagore emphasizes um, the subjective aspect in sciences, and Dupitya Patopadia says there I have to agree with, with Tagore. Um, so there is, at the same time, a borrowing and an influence of phenomenology into Indian philosophy at that time, and at the same time they use this influence and this concept to return it against uh, what they see is a uh, what they refute basically, uh, which is too much emphasis on uh, analysis and linguistics. So I will I will jump a little bit, but I want to show you this. Um, so just uh, a little bit of details, of course, to also show you um, what I understand as humanism, contemporary Indian philosophy, and how to define them. So at this point, I also want to emphasize the complexity of this tradition. As I just said, the complexity of how to reuse concepts from different traditions to give something that is very new and that is neither a criticism only of Western philosophy or neither a criticism only of classical Indian philosophy or neither a criticism only of modern Indian philosophy, but a kind of navigating between philosophical worlds because of a hermeneutic situation that is uh, cross-cultural and how to think at the same time through these traditions. And this is um, an illustration by such an Anamurti that illustrates it very well. He admits it in, in the very preface of his book, Man, Metaphysics and Freedom. My thought is firmly rooted in Vedanta and to some extent the teaching of the Buddha but I have not been impervious to the contemporary philosophical situation. The writings of the existentialists, especially Jaspers, have much influenced me. I owe many ideas and certain plans of thinking to Heidegger, Buber, Marcel, Niebuhr, and others. But I believe the final outcome is not just a reinterpretation of Vedanta or a resume of existentialism, but one possible type of synthesis under the two influences of psychology and cultural anthropology without forgetting the lessons of linguistic analysis. And of course, this is both um, the reason why it's so difficult to describe contemporary Indian philosophy and to classify it in, in one box, um, which we like to do when we teach economic Indian philosophy or when we teach philosophy, because it's convenient to describe authors are being uh, continental or uh, analytical philosophers, and so Indian philosophy resists all these kind of uh, of attempts and of compartments and boxes. And at the same time, I think it's precisely also why it is uh, original and interesting because it teaches us a lot on the dialogical dimension of philosophy and of contemporary Indian philosophy, and it criticizes both the way we do Indian philosophy from an ontology perspective as a kind of commentary interpretation or commentary idea of philosophy, and of course from our mainstream Western philosophical departments where everything has to be um, fit in one classes on ethics and politics and be realist or idealist and so on. So it kind of questions everything in a sense, and in that sense, I find it radical. Um, I have just 10 minutes, so I want to say just a few, a few things finally on humanism to be a little, um, 
to show you also the ambivalence of the term and not to pretend that it works perfectly to describe contemporary Indian philosophy. So um, reading more and more of the academic Indian philosophy, I find that there are three main lines of influence, the intellectual influence on, on humanism that more often than not go together. So one, I see uh, one line following Emin Roy, I mentioned as radical humanist, that is a kind of very affirmatively scientific, sometimes materialist, and in any case, secular view of Indian philosophy with a strong influence on freedom as individual freedom on social progress, political philosophy. On the other hand, and that's the part where really it becomes problematic to work with humanism, there is a line by Radhakrishnan and Piti Raju in particular, which at the same time, so we are there, these are the predecessors to my generation, so it's the time where um, colonization was a reality, and so Radhakrishnan's way and uh, Piti Raju's way of tackling Western colonization was to emphasize and argue on the spirituality of Indian philosophy against the kind of too positivistic and too scientific and too materialist uh, view of philosophy of the West. And I mean, I, of course, is doing the opposite. Um, and the third line of influence, I think, is by those who are inspired by Tagore. Um, Tagore is a little in between. Um, for him, at that point, India had to avoid, I mean, India vis-a-vis -vis the West had to avoid the trouble of nationalism that he, he wrote about in a famous lecture. So his humanism is a um, neither overly spiritual as to affirming the superiority of Indian philosophy because of its spirituality, but it's also not to follow the secularism and the materialism of the West and freedom in that sense, because at his time, um, he lived the First and Second World War, so the West was not a mere um, something to follow. And so, yeah, so humanism in this literature can mean then several things. And at the end, I think that it's precisely because it could mean different things and it was encompassing enough that Indian philosophers were uh, attracted to humanism because within this humanistic idea, they could reuse, reinterpret, and, and challenge um, a wide range of ideologies. So I think that it, I think that it's because the meaning is wide that it was actually used and reused and, and taken up in contemporary Indian philosophy. But it's true that, um, that the problem remains uh, that there is a, um, an ambiguity between those who use the term humanism with a spiritual sense, in particular those who follow the near Advaita and who confront Western philosophy with it, and those who use humanism as radical humanism as a materialist opposition to Vedantin influence. And and just have a very quick look there. So this is uh, also an anthology of contemporary Indian philosophy by Bikil, uh, I'm sorry, D.L. Kumar, which is also very much used in India. And for him, it's very, it's written still in the, in the 70s, but it's the opposite of what I said. Um, They all are humanist Indian philosophers. Some of them combine both humanism and humanitarianism. 
but their philosophical humanism is of a particular type. Humanism these days has come to acquire a definite import. It is scientific humanism. It's based on the realization that is man itself who can shape his own destiny. And then he says this kind of humanism becomes positivistic, secular, and disworldly in its outlook. Obviously, this doctrine is not compatible with the standpoint adopted by the contemporary Indian thinkers. They have an unflinching faith in the ultimacy of spiritual pursuits and ideals. And indeed, in his anthology, he uh, wrote the list, he means Vivekananda, Tagore, Gandhi, Aurobindo, Kesi Bhattacharya, Hare Krishna, and Igban. Um, the earlier figures. So he is using spiritual humanism to distinguish himself probably also from Emin Roy and people following radical humanism. So there is even there an internal um, debate and possible disagreement. Um, so I'll just conclude and I'll go a little um, quickly on the last thing. So of course, this is not the whole of contemporary Indian philosophy. Um, I think it says something important at that time. It expresses something that was missing for contemporary India, for independent India. Um, that is the emphasis on the human self, the human self in the plural, the human self that is intersubjectivity, intersubjectivity connected the human self that is historically grounded in philosophy in India at that time, um, which has historical reasons for sure, conceptual reasons for sure, and which is deeply engaged in a very complex and multidirectional dialogue with modern sources that are just before them, including to debate on, on freedom at the time of Indian independence, including spiritual figures, more spiritually oriented figures, including classical Indian concepts, including Western development of phenomenology, existentialism, and philosophical anthropology at that time. I think there are three directions which I won't develop now, which are important for philosophical development. One is epistemic, epistemic pluralism and how it started a debate actually on um, pluralism, which was an epistemological necessity at that time um, to understand different frameworks, to admit different standpoints, to understand the plurality and uh, different views on science and hermeneutics. That's one debate. I think another one, but I think it's clear is Dharma and the subjectivity to question also the idea of, of human rights, the social idea, the political idea of India and independence. And so philosophically, how we connect to others, how we are related with others. Um, and in Indian philosophy, it's also, there are a lot of criticism of, of poor charters as a, as a hierarchy of values that is questioned at that time. And the last one I evoked is liberation and freedom and the liberation out of the world versus, uh, versus freedom in the world that is in particular important at the time of Indian independence. So finally, and I'll, I'll conclude again, why is it important, I think, to include this view of contemporary Indian philosophy and why should we not stop at, I don't know, Tagore or Gandhi or Vivekananda? I try to show, and I hope that they manage that much, to show that the dialogue, that Indian philosophy never stopped and is just uh, continuing in the 20th century and first it's an injustice to, to decide that it um, it's classical and dead or just modern and, and it is new Advaita, but also because it gives us a um, lively and a very uh, complex uh, understanding of what is dialogue in philosophy and in philosophical developments and how to think of uh, 
in classical, contemporary Indian and Western, not as dichotomies, but are con as continuous responses and philosophical responses that um, continue Indian philosophy. And, and the last point is, I did not include here, um, this addiction has different, has also another problem. I barely mentioned um, Muslim philosophies. This diversity in India is something that um, people often ask me, and it's true. Um, this diversity of contemporary Indian philosophy is not the whole picture, and it should go and can discuss about it, but it should include also different communities and different philosophical developments in contemporary Indian philosophy. That's for sure. And that's also why I mentioned Satchitananda Moti, who actually made an effort to include different communities, and there are also dialogical experiments in that sense. So I'll stop here, and I'm just three minutes our time. And thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Kukuro Salma. Um, <clears throat> it was a very, it was a lovely mixture of um, erudition and um, really, really insightful and thought provoking. So thank you. Um, just for every, so everyone knows, here's how questions are going to work. If you can, please use the raise hand function and um, then I'll kind of try to keep an eye on whose hand goes up first and call you in order. Um, just to start with, with one question. I, I was definitely convinced um, by, you know, you highlighting that, you know, we, in order to not um, betray or reduce the fundamentally dialogical dimension of all the different diverse, diverse strands of contemporary Indian philosophy, and yet at the same time to have a grouping under this um, word humanism, that, that convinced me. Um, however, I just wondered if you kind of began to hint at this towards the end, but in your view, what are some of the limitations of that word humanistic or humanism with this grouping? Are there any limitations you can think of? That was just one thing I was curious about. So, yeah. Sure, sure. Um, my, one is um, honestly that, um, of course, it, it limits the philosophers I include. And I do it knowing uh, and admitting that it doesn't encompass the whole of contemporary Indian philosophy at that time. And in particular, um, indeed, Indian philosophy was influenced by analytical philosophy from England in particular. And so there is a whole other development in uh, logic, analytical philosophy, philosophy of mind, which Partly, some of them fit in epistemological pluralism because some of them were interested in thinking epistemologically the question of plurality. So in that sense, um, they have a humanistic dimension. But I mean, there are also just um, philosophers interested in, in logic and in either in Western logic or in kind of translating um, Indian logic into Western logic, and this is not necessarily related to to humanism. So there are some philosophers that I leave aside. They, ha they are lucky, they have had a better perception. That's why I allow myself to leave them aside. Bikki Matilal, in particular, um, played a major role in, in including um, analytical Indian philosophy into the canon. So I think they are better off in that sense. Um, but yeah, and that's and one limit. The other limit I talked about is that um, humanism is not a homogeneous concept. And so, of course, um, it can mean not exactly one thing and its opposite, but uh, it can have very different connotations, which, which I think are interesting to show its development. But, uh, of course, you could also say then you can put everything into it. It's not cool, you cannot put everything into it, but it's true that it has uh, internal tensions and that I, I don't want to even try to erase because I think it's part of the, of the concept. Uh, brilliant, thank you so much for that reply. I'm gonna go now to Professor Richard King. Uh, 
thank you, Andrew. Um, thank you, Elise. Um, I, I really enjoyed um, your, your talk, and and I, I particularly like the the conclusion, <laughs> in, in the sense that the the idea that um, one of the ways in which uh, humanism this is my reading. Tell me if I've done this wrongly, but uh, because humanism can cover a variety of slightly different metaphysical commitments. Um, so you can have a, if you like, a more secularist version or, or, or one that, that, that ha combines other, for want of a better word, spiritual or supernaturalist elements within it, um, that, uh, that it works as a discourse for um, recognition and representation of Indian philosophy. And, it, and it's that recognition and, and reputation that I wanted to ask you about, because I think I'd like to make a distinction between the fact that we can recognize that because Indian philosophy is so rich and diverse, that there is indeed much going on in that tradition, which could be classified under the root, this this particular rubric, this construction of humanistic in the way that you describe, but how, but we can still distinguish that from the fact that why, why is this discourse emerging? And for me, and I'd like your views on this, um, it relates to what we might call the elephant in the room, which is that many of these thinkers are writing in a context of coloniality um, and in a situation where um, something you've written about um, yourself, about the, the kind of exclusion, the classification and the, the kind of um, regionalization of Indian philosophers. So you have like the Pandic communities who have been much reduced. You have academic institutionalized philosophers. And then of course you have a whole gamut of, as you rightly pointed out, political public figures who are thought of as philosophers, but might not be thought of as academic philosophers in the, in the strict sense. Um, and, and so in that context, uh, Indian, characterizing modern Indian philosophy is quite difficult because you could be too narrow <laughs> if you just focus on the academic philosophers. But, but, the, but the issue there is gatekeeping or part one of the issues, isn't it? it it's what, what is allowed to go into this space this global space called philosophy and the fact that in this period of time the shift in modern western philosophy is very much towards a kind of secular self-understanding of itself uh, uh, um, and so do you see this discourse of humanism and, and humanistic reflections which i accept is coming out of indian traditions but do you see it at all as a response to Western hegemony, coloniality, and if you like, knocking on the door of philosophy to get into the into the debate. Thank you, um, for the question. Sure, um, it's a question about which we could, I think, speak one more hour um, because there are many gatekeepers of different kinds. So it's hard to restrict. I mean. The role of Indian philosophy, in a way, does not receive the place it deserves. It is true for philosophy in Sanskrit, including um, contemporary philosophers in Sanskrit in more traditional communities who have um, usually restrict, with very restricted access to the global discourse. It is true of vernacular Indian philosophies in Bengali, in Hindi, in South Indian languages, um, which are very difficult to access and to receive in the global discourse. It is true of um, my English writing Indian philosophers. And the question indeed that I uh, asked myself earlier was why? Because they write in English, so that should be easy. And it's not. And of course, so it's, um, it's a response to colonization yet. I was focusing on um, only on this earlier in the sense on emphasizing the the decolonization or the post-colonial response, which you see you have even in Kesipatacharya and Swarajana ideas, 
you have early texts that are uh, like texts literally fighting um, colonization in India. You have a lot of that during the period preceding independence of uh, philosophers engaged in the idea of thinking freedom for India, thinking political freedom for India, thinking a nation for India, an independent nation. And so you have a, a lot of political social philosophy that emerges. Yet today, uh, it's not that I don't think it's important. It is there the whole time. But I think in India, if we only focus on the post-colonial dimension of English Indian philosophy at that time, we also tend to miss the internal debate. Because at that time, there is also a lot of political philosophy for reforming uh, Indian orthodoxy. There are also a lot of debates engaging with classical Indian philosophy to detach it from its sacrality or the, the felt uh, sacrality of the world and the difficulty to criticize the idea of moksha as a goal of Indian philosophy. There are so internally also between the pandits and these English more secular philosophers uh, tension in trying to combat a certain sense of orthodoxy within the Hindu um, philosophies. So today, I don't mean that the post-colonial is not important, but I don't want it to hide uh, much more diverse and in a sense, in an Indian context, more urgent kind of debate, including on the diversity on of Indian philosophy, including uh, women, including, you know, the poem of caste and why we have only Bengali Brahmins writing philosophy in the 20th century. So I totally agree with you, but I don't want to calibrate lectures according to this so as not to miss extremely important internal debates and evolutions of Indian philosophy also. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much for your reply, um, Elise. I'm going to go next to um, Abhishek Mal. Am I saying that correctly? Go ahead. Yes, my name is. Yes, thank you so much. First, I want to thank you that you are doing some sort of an applied intercultural philosophy. And this I like personally very much. Now, I just would like to have a few sympathetic critical comments. I mean, Buddhism on the one hand and the Hindu philosophy on the other hand. Whether in, I mean, Buddhism is a, Buddha was a heretic. Buddhism has an ethics without theology. And Hinduism has both with theology and without theology. My question is how to, how to get the overlap between these different uh, concepts definitions of humanism, because without some sort of an overlap, it's going to be a fight endless. And this overlap more or less has to be found even if God is the source, or say in the philosophy of Kant, it is some sort of transcendent reason. So I would have liked you to talk about uh, Ambedkar's humanism, which is humanism par excellence. You just imagine, I mean, Hinayana, Mahayana, Vajrayana, and Navayana, that is the Hinduism, this is the fourth Buddhism. And there it is humanism purely. Buddha is just on the ground. You know? And of course, he, he one may be a Buddhist in believing Nirvana as a category outside. So there I feel um, that uh, this should be taken as a very powerful concept of humanism, which has uh, more overlaps with any tradition all over the world. And then I, I would like to say that somehow Indian epistemology always says there is uh, Indian epistemology 
ज्ञान प्राप्ति एंड फल प्राप्ति दैट मीन्स वी गेट नॉलेज एंड वी ऑल्सो एक्ट अकॉर्डिंग टू दिस नॉलेज सो इन दिस फल प्राप्ति एक्विजिशन ऑफ रिजल्ट ऑलवेज देर इज सम एथिक्स and herian Her- Her- nice the philosopher he says indian philosophy is not only a way of thought but at the same time it is also a way of life and this way of life may be met- metaphysically ontologically or just humanistically ethically grounded and this point should be made clear in uh, in, in talking with the european philosophers you know for the last nearly 35 years i am fighting here with many colleagues eh? and all of them they say you indians do philosophy but uh, if you don't do philosophy the way you do, we do philosophy then of course it is no philosophy and since i have been living here for the last 50 years then i say but for for um, for schopenhauer hegel's philosophy is the word he use hegelai you know i mean it is just a a um, uh, 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 very uh, my, um, negative word for hegel no and hegel's philosophy for but russell is myth so at at home they have the same trouble but the moment european philosophical thinking faces africa latin america india then all of a sudden they think we have one voice of european philosophy and i'm so happy that we are doing this intercultural philosophy we did so you did so much for the intercultural philosophy here in germany and europe thank you so much thank you very much and uh, and you are very right and um, these are two questions buddhism you are absolutely right that um, i focus too much on advaita vedanta and responses to advaita vedanta and i Mm, did not give i do not give in general enough uh, importance to contemporary reinterpretation of buddhism that school is ambedkar and interestingly if you see the list ambedkar is not included in all these anthologies of even public figures next to gandhi and tagore and nehru mm-hmm. and um although today i mean in places like in india it's too large but in places like jnu it is very much he is very much considered as a philosopher so there is a problem with ambedkar in academic indian philosophy and uh, that's for sure but for buddhism before i forget i want to add he is not the only one actually even in academic indian philosophy and vibhanji has a book on marx and buddhism in which he uh, sees who buddhism the, he explored this idea of intersubjective essential intersubjective relation with others and um, sachidananda namurti also mentions buddhism so you are very right that it it plays a role because of the lack also of god uh, for this humanist it's like an inspiration for this contemporary humanist because we avoid the problem the theological problem um and for ambedkar yes sure and he i should i think include him as an influence because i'm interested in uh, academic indian philosophy in departments but it's true that i should maybe add the fourth line of influence following ambedkar and that i will keep in mind and the second person is theory and practice basically and uh, again you are very right there is a lot also of writings on practice and humanistic practice vis-a-vis theory and this is in response indeed to the western over emphasis on theory and theories and uh, ways of theorizing um you are right that there is a kind of parallel so krishna chandra bhattacharya for example is very much inspired by the hegelian model and builds an extremely difficult abstract theory and that after him um as in western developments were 
And there are reflections on the life world and practices and ethics and all. So after Krishna Chandra Bhattacharya, the same happens in contemporary philosophy with the, with an emphasis on practice that comes back, although actually for Krishna Bhattacharya, it's more ambiguous than this. Um, so definitely, I mean, uh, it's part, and it's often part of the responses to Western philosophy and of the critic to Western philosophy, uh, that even humanism remains a kind of theoretical idea, and that in Indian philosophies, there are concepts like practice sadhana that can ground humanism to ethics and practical questions. So um, you're absolutely right, I agree. It's, um, it's a different way to put it, and it's a different line of the dialogue between India and the West, and uh, I mean, you're right, but it's very difficult to to make it um, admissible to the Western discourse. Um, I have, I mean, we all try to do, as you said, I have no magical response to, to include it to the Western discourse, but yeah, you're, you're right, it's one more line of the of the dialogue that I could um, definitely include in the in the humanity. Thank you for both of them. I will I will write them down. Thanks again, um Elise. Um we have time for one more question. I see Richard, did you want to ask a, a follow up? Is that right? Um no I just wanted to quickly make the point that I, I think that including Ambedkar is also important in relation to Elise's earlier point about the Brahmanical domination of Indian philosophy, and and so that's why I think that's also an important voice. Thanks. Sure, sure. And but I'm I want to see who is directly influenced because for me he's still part of my public figures, intellectual figures. So the question that is really interesting for me now is who is directly influenced by him and takes up his voice into the academic philosophical discourse and that's a harder question I have to say. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we're close to the end now, but is there any, uh, is, we have time for one last quick question if anybody else has any thoughts or, or questions. Okay, well, um, on that note then, um, do you have any final thoughts you want to share, Elise, or are we happy to close? No, I'm, I'm very thankful for all the, the remarks and the points and discussions, and um, um, I'm sincerely thankful because I will write them down and <laughs> think further about it, so it's, um, it helps me to continue uh, thinking about, about the topic, and so thank you so much for your engagement and your question. Right. Well, thank you so much for such an interesting talk and um, I wish everybody a lovely weekend wherever you are and thank you again um, Dr. Kakurosama. Um, thank you so uh, much. Yeah, I'll, I'm going to close the meeting now but please look out your emails for the updates from Elvis about future, future events. So bye everyone. Thank you.